Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hello, and welcome to the Sound Bites Podcast. Today's episode is about digestive health and dairy. We will discuss lactose intolerance, fermented foods, probiotics, live and active cultures, and even how mindfulness can impact your gut health. My guests today are Dr. Robert Murray and registered dietitian and nutritionist Amanda Sauceda. Dr. Robert Murray spent more than 20 years as a pediatric gastroenterologist in the Ohio State University College of Medicine. Since 2003, Dr. Murray has focused on educating physicians, dietitians, and parents about pediatric nutrition. Amanda specializes in mindfulness and gut health and says that gut health goes beyond digestion, that good gut health is about nourishing the gut microbiome and also the mind-gut connection. Welcome to the show, Dr. Murray and Amanda. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks for having us. I do want my listeners to know that this episode is sponsored by the American Dairy Association Mideast, the American Dairy Association Indiana, and the Dairy Alliance. We thank them for their sponsorship and support of the podcast. And we are also submitting this episode to the Commission on Dietetic Registration for one free continuing education unit for registered dietitian nutritionists, dietetic technicians registered, and certified diabetes care and education specialists. Also, I worked for the Dairy Council for eight years, from 2003 to 2011. I worked for the Midwest Dairy Council, and I was the National Dairy Council spokesperson. Now, Dr. Murray and Amanda, I would love to hear more about each of your backgrounds before we dive into our discussion about digestive health, as well as any disclosures you may have to note. So, Dr. Murray, let's start with you. Well, as you mentioned, Melissa, I spent uh, over 20 years doing clinical practice in pediatric GI and nutrition. And then in 2003, I actually went to work for Abbott Nutrition as a pediatric medical director and worked there for three years. I went back to the Children's Hospital to develop and run the uh, obesity center there, uh, which was new. Mm. And then for the past 10 years or so, I've really been working on education, both here in the U.S. and around the world. Excellent. Thank you. And Amanda, let's hear more about you. Yeah, so I'm a registered dietitian and um, gosh, I'm trying to figure out how long it's been. I go by cycles. So I think I have done like at least one cycle. With your continuing ed? Yeah, with my continuing education. Always knew I wanted to be a dietitian though. Knew since high school simply because I love food. Knew I would never get tired of talking about food. And gut health and mindfulness kind of came later on when I realized how powerful and impactful the gut is and how impactful and powerful the mind can be on the gut, which is why I like talking so much about mindfulness and gut health. And I like to say my favorite food because I think it's fun, but it's pizza. (laughs) Got to agree with you there. Can't go wrong with that. Well, you and I were on a board together. I think it was Nutrition Entrepreneurs. Yeah, I still am. I love that group. It's awesome. Yeah. Great people, meet wonderful people on that group. Very much. Well, great. It was good hearing a little bit more about both of your backgrounds. Let's just dive in. We know that good digestive health or gut health is essential to good overall health. It's not only important that we have healthy digestion, which is needed to, you know, break down and absorb the nutrients we need, but gut health also impacts our immune system. So let's start with an overview of why healthy digestion is important and kind of how it works. So Dr. Murray, could you address this? You know, I think when you consider health with digestive health, the best digestive health is if you don't think about it at all. And that Mm -hmm. means that you're running smooth and everything's going fine. Unfortunately, there's an awful lot of people that develop uh, symptoms that's related to eating. And that can be everything from swallowing a lot of air during eating and feeling bloated and belching to gas and bloating, cramping, diarrhea, even constipation can all be kind of tied into that. And it crisscrosses with the same symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, which uh, is getting over into Amanda's area of (sighs) mind-gut. And a lot of people have irritable bowel, and it's difficult sometimes for them 
to tease out whether it's a food-related problem or whether it is a mind-related problem or both. Yeah. Uh, Yes, I've talked about digestive health quite a bit on the podcast, and I will share some of those episodes towards the end and, and link to those in my show notes. But, you know, whether it's a food intolerance or even getting a diagnosis can be really challenging. Yeah. And when you don't have good gut health and you don't feel good, that does impact your mental health and vice versa. And they're really tied in together in so many ways. So I'm really glad we're talking about this topic and incorporating the mind aspect as well. Speaking of that, Amanda, why don't you kind of give us an overview of your area of expertise working with the mind-gut connection. Definitely. I also forgot to mention the disclosure. So I'm a National Dairy Council ambassador. Thank you for sharing that. And, and Dr. Murray, I should ask you again if you have disclosures to share. I do a lot of speaking for and with the National Dairy Council and their affiliates, and I have for 35 years. It's just, to me, a very important piece of nutrition. Yes, and I can say, having been a National Dairy Council spokesperson We do. Well, I still say we, but it's been years since I worked with them. But the Dairy (laughs) Council does a wonderful job finding experts like yourself who have your own expertise in the area and can speak to these topics and and to the evidence-based information and all the research that's going on. So thank you both for that. So Amanda, tell us about what you work with in regards to the mind-gut connection. Yeah. One thing that Dr. Murray said, I think, really stood out to me because it was presented just differently, was the idea that with good gut health, it's something you don't necessarily need to think about, right? Like it it should be flowing effortlessly and doing its job without any second thought from you. And I think that's a really kind of powerful thing to think about is from A to B to C, you know, all the way down through your digestive tract, it's going the way it should be. When I was working a lot one-on-one with people and even education, like I also teach and I talk to students about all of these things, one of the most common things that underlies a lot of the mindfulness and gut health piece is that the foundation stuff. The consistency is where you find the best gut health, right, for yourself. Consistency with good gut health, like good gut health foods, just good gut health practices and keeping that up. And I think that's where a lot of the mindfulness can come in is listening to your body. What does it need? So I'll give a personal example of me like yesterday. I was really tired, but I was fighting it. You know, like babies fight sleep and you're like, you know, you're (laughs) tired. Just let yourself sleep. Mm -hmm. That felt like me last night. And there definitely is research looking at sleep, just obviously sleep in of itself and then sleep impacting your digestion, sleep potentially impacting your gut microbiome. So simple things like consistency of good sleep, consistency of good eating habits, like Dr. Murray was also saying, you know, are you taking in a lot of air where a great aspect of mindfulness can come in when you're eating is, are you slowing down? Are you being present when you're eating or are you like doom scrolling, you know, on Instagram or TikTok at the same time, because if you're stressed when you come into your meal, you're less likely to feel good digestion afterwards, you know? So I think that's a lot of where things can be so impactful is those foundational skills of good eating habits, good sleep, um, listening to your body, because that's what's going to really move you day to day forward. Yes. Listening to our bodies is definitely key and it's hard sometimes Yeah, But I think it's really important when it comes to explaining and um, discussing this with your healthcare provider to, you know, hopefully get a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that when we're talking about digestive health and dairy, lactose intolerance comes to mind. And before I worked for the Dairy Council, one of my jobs was as an outpatient dietitian. And when patients would tell me that they had lactose intolerance, Uh, First and foremost, I didn't really ask if they had a formal diagnosis. I just, you know, took their word for it. And to their point, they're explaining, look, I'm having problems. And I learned later, well, it might not be lactose intolerance. It could be irritable bowel. It could be a a whole slew of things. Mm -hmm. But when they would tell me that, I simply just encouraged them to get their calcium from other food sources or supplements if needed. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to provide a quick fix for calcium without really fully realizing that dairy is far more than calcium. Uh, But when I worked for the Dairy Council, I was surprised to learn that some people with lactose intolerance 
can actually tolerate some dairy products. Yeah. And again, the dairy actually has a lot to offer and actually has a lot to offer to gut health, which was really great news because most of the patients who reported this lactose intolerance were really sad to cut dairy out of their diet. Yeah, they do. It's like, it's, it could be emotional for people. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, eating is personal. Yeah, they hate giving up cheese. Yeah, cheese, cheese is the big one. <laughs> right. It's a big one, yeah. You know, and so when I was a new Dairy Council dietitian, we weren't talking a lot about lactose intolerance at the time. And I just felt like this was the most important thing we could talk about. Yeah. Because there were so many people out there who wanted to incorporate dairy into their diets. So we're going to talk about that. Let's start with you, Dr. Murray. What do we need to know about lactose intolerance? What exactly is it? What is it not? How prevalent is it? And of course, you know, we want to talk about how we can manage it. Well, it's a fascinating area. Over time, most populations have a genetic loss of this little enzyme called lactase that splits lactose and allows the individual glucose and galactose to get absorbed. And if it doesn't split, it tends to go into the colon. So the first issue for people is, do they have lactase insufficiency or deficiency? Moving the lactose into the colon isn't necessarily a problem. It's called malabsorption, but it's not necessarily associated with symptoms. The reason is the bacteria there, the microbial community is so powerful that they'll break it down pretty quickly and efficiently. The problem comes in when you intermittently eat a ton of it, you know, mm -hmm. enough to cross a threshold and you overwhelm those bacteria and their ability to split the lactose. And then the lactose pulls water, causes all kinds of problems. When it does get digested, there's a gassiness, cramping, bloating, and other things. So that's the third component. First is lactase insufficiency. The second is the sugar moving into the colon called malabsorption. And the third is lactose intolerance, meaning you have symptoms tied to the lactose malabsorption into the colon. And those are all independent of one another. What they found from the studies and what changed your talk with patients back in the day and my talk with patients, we always had the same thing, you know, well, you're intolerant to lactose, then move away. The studies showed that only about 4% of people with lactase deficiency actually have lactose intolerance when they tested them in a blinded way and studied the markers for lactose intolerance. And so what happens is you have a number of people who feel they're lactose intolerant. And again, we come back to that mind-body thing. In fact, I had a friend who would swear that if he had any lactose at all, even a little bit of cheese or yogurt or milk, within 15 minutes, you got diarrhea and cramping. Pretty unlikely that the lactose made it from his mouth all the way down and caused symptoms in a 15-minute span. You know, there's an awful lot of intestine that has to work with it. Much more likely that he's psychologically primed for symptoms. And as Amanda said, the brain has a lot to do with gut health. And so lactose intolerance and this kind of irritable bowel connection there, those two frequently overlap. The point I want to make here about it is that even though African-Americans, Hispanic communities, Asians, and Mediterranean communities all tend to lose lactase, they mostly can tolerate some lactose in the form of milk, many of them, but also cheese, yogurt, kefir, all kinds of things that they can consume. And the National Medical Association and the Hispanic Medical Association are very concerned that those populations get dairy into their diet on a daily basis and meet their dairy recommendations. People began to think, well, it may be that we can get lactose and dairy products into people who, even if they have lactase deficiency, and you do that by training the microbiome. It's a fascinating population. It's trillions, hundreds of trillions of bacteria in our colon. Yeah. It's the most dense population of bacteria in nature, in the human colon. And if you change what you eat and consistently consume 
things like lactose, fiber, other things that might have bothered you previously. That consistency that Amanda talked about is what makes the difference because you essentially train a population of bacteria that have the lactase enzyme capability and they become more and more efficient at clearing lactose. The problem we get in is when we have a surge of lactose, you suddenly have a milkshake or you have a pizza and a milkshake, even worse, you know? And you, you know, that is the problem. But if you have milk on cereal every day or you have yogurt parfaits every day, that's different. Those people tend to tolerate that. And that was a discovery that really opened up the dairy food group to populations who otherwise couldn't tolerate it. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, you mentioned fiber. Even fiber-rich foods can cause GI distress. To your point, if it's kind of inconsistent. Absolutely. We talk about that a lot. You know, increasing fiber, do it gradually, do it consistently, drink plenty of fluids. So it sounds like it's the same thing with lactose-containing foods. Yep. I want to reiterate, you know, what you're saying, because that's something that I had learned as well, is that someone could technically be lactose intolerant, but not have any symptoms because maybe they're eating it consistently or they're not hitting that threshold where they've, they've been avoiding it. And then they binge on, you know, something containing dairy because they've been craving it and, and want to include it in their diet. Again, going back to that sort of consistency. But I have a question about diagnosis. Is it important or necessary to have a test and be diagnosed with lactose intolerance and also kind of ruling out other GI disturbances? I think for the most part, most physicians would not necessarily do a formal test for lactose intolerance. We used to do introduction of fairly substantial dose. And then we would take it out of the diet and then we would reintroduce it, you know, and see what kind of symptoms followed. Uh, the ideal would be if the patient was blinded, because as I said, you know, if they know that there's lactose there, they anticipate that they may have symptoms and that can confuse things a little bit. I think for the most part, if people say they're lactose intolerant, the physicians then begin to counsel them differently urging them to take advantage of fermented foods, hard cheeses, yogurt, sauerkraut, you know, I mean, I mean, cottage cheese, things like that, to make sure that they're getting the foods that they need. And then slowly you can introduce a small amount of milk on cereal and then milk and, you know, cream soups or something and slowly build that up until you arrive at pizza and you're in Amanda's household and you can actually can actually eat your pizza every day and feel <laughs> and feel fairly comfortable with it. Right. So let's talk about why different lactose containing foods are better tolerated than others. Because I know from my dairy council days that, you know, milk has 12 grams of carbohydrate lactose and yogurt has live and active cultures, which can help and a lot of the cheeses have little or no lactose, but that's my basic explanation. I would love to hear from you why certain foods are tolerated better than others, aside from the consistency in the diet issue. And then why is pizza so challenging if it's cheese and cheese has little or no lactose? Yeah, it's a little confusing in that regard. All cheeses are not the same in the density of lactose, and hard cheeses tend to be uh, more fermented, more likely to have had that lactose broken down during processing. Pizza with mozzarella on it, mozzarella is a very soft cheese. It has a lot of lactose. It's very easily accessible, and I think people struggle sometimes with that. But those are the kind of things that you want to counsel the patients who have lactase deficiency. You want to counsel them how to approach it and what kind of things need to be part of the backbone of their daily diet. So if they are eating hard cheeses and yogurt consistently and can use a small amount of, of milk, they will be able to gradually move to mozzarella and other cheeses because, as I said, you've trained that bacterial population of the colon to handle the dairy lactose. Right. And I'd like you to speak more to that because that's something that I don't think is common knowledge. 
is that you can incorporate little bits of lactose more and more and more and tolerate more. So can you speak to the research on that? We've looked at that for the last 20 years or so, and physicians have become very comfortable with it. You see it addressed in studies on bone health and studies on, you know, many different aspects where they're looking for dairy in the diet. The lack of dairy in the diet is associated with a lower diet quality score, for one thing, a quite significant drop in diet quality score, but also a higher risk for hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. And that is a real problem in African Americans, um, Africans, Mediterraneans, and the Hispanic populations from South America. Those medical organizations, National Medical Association, the Hispanic Medical Association, really want to get that message out to physicians and their patients of how to do this gradual introduction in order to achieve full dairy intake in the diet. And they've shown, for the most part, it can be done. There are other things you can do. Lactate milk, for example, is a type of milk that where the lactase has been broken down, or you can buy regular milk and buy your drops and put the drops in there. And that all works well. But the health benefits of dairy are so high that these associations say we all should be trying our best to get dairy fully in the diet. Right. Not only does dairy provide calcium, it's a high quality source of protein, but other important vitamins and minerals. Absolutely. Can you tell us more about this higher risk of hypertension, cardiovascular disease and diabetes? Why is that associated with decreased dairy intake? Well, at first, no one really understood why hypertension was so well addressed with dairy, but they've started to look at various mechanisms. And one of them is the fact that dairy is the number one source of potassium in the food supply. And potassium competes with sodium in the kidney. If it's not there, the sodium gets reabsorbed into the bloodstream. But if potassium is there consistently, it will compete and less sodium gets absorbed. And as we all know, uh, sodium is one of the triggers for hypertension, one of the things that drives hypertension. I think it's important that we get that message across. The dairy associations pushed bone health, calcium and vitamin D for decades, and people don't realize this is a food package and a very powerful one. It has fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. The protein is at the absolute highest quality protein matching that of eggs. It also has three of the four nutrients of concern in the public health population, and that is calcium, vitamin D, and potassium. Three of the four, that's the number one source in our, in our food supply is coming from dairy. So when you sacrifice that, you lose, you know, phosphorus, all the B vitamins and things, but you also lose those very important macronutrients, fats, carbs, and protein, and these key micronutrients. All right. Thank you. Yes, I don't think a lot of people realize the importance of potassium in good blood pressure. Right. So thank you for explaining that. And you mentioned, you know, trying to communicate to physicians, you know, as a registered dietitian who was counseling patients. And just as a nutrition communicator, we know that the first line of education for many patients is that conversation with their physician. And as you mentioned, and I mentioned, we're trying to kind of do a quick fix and, and help people and pivot. But a lot of times we need to kind of take a step back. And, you know, how do we get more physicians, more pediatricians to understand all of these nuances so that they can really help people have a higher quality diet and incorporate dairy if they can and if they want to, when it's just so easy to just say, well, it's just calcium. Yeah, there's been a lot of work on that for a long time, uh, both, you know, in my association, the American Academy of Pediatrics have put out a number of different policy statements pointing out the wide variety of benefits of dairy. And as I mentioned, the other American Medical Association, American Heart Association, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics all have spoken with one voice that this is one of the five food groups, dairy. And if we would hit that food group, it would make an enormous difference on our global health. So 
it's important. It's a critical thing. And I think we're still trying podcasts like yours, Melissa, will make a difference because people hear the way the thinking is now, not the way it was in the year 2000. Right. Um, And just one more question before we turn to Amanda to talk about counseling patients with lactose intolerance. Um, I do want you to clarify the difference between a lactose intolerance and a milk allergy. Yeah, milk allergy is caused by the immune system overreacting to the protein antigens in milk. And, you know, it's the same mechanism that's behind hay fever to ragweed and, you know, all the other things that people suffer that are true allergies. The response is this histamine release, which causes a lot of different symptoms. And in the GI tract, milk allergy will cause the usual types of swelling and inflammation, and it will cause peristalsis and things. So you'll get cramping, you get loose stools and bloating and gassiness along with that as well. That is a very specific response, and it's not very common. You don't see milk allergy very commonly. We see it in pediatrics early, and it's usually not very severe, and they outgrow it within the first few years. So one of the things you don't want to do is abandon dairy because they had some kind of a a milk allergy early in life. You don't want to abandon it for life. It's something you want to come back to. The lactose intolerance is simply the inability to split that sugar. It does not involve the immune system and it does not cause any kind of damage in the upper part of the intestine and things like a milk allergy would do. It's simply a mechanical problem with breaking the sugar and the bacteria create this gas and fluid influx that causes a lot of the symptoms. Okay, right. Very different. Milk allergy is normally in children. They tend to outgrow it. It's the protein, whereas lactose intolerance, the carbohydrate and the digestive problems with that. Right. Great. Thank you. So Amanda, how do you counsel patients with lactose intolerance? You know, a lot of my listeners are just general public, but we also have some healthcare professionals listening as well. So I think we can speak to both audiences when we talk about how to manage lactose intolerance. Yeah, I think one of the first places that I like to start with is what are their goals, right? Like always try to do something patient-centered or client-centered. What food would you like to work towards? You know, what foods did you already like? What foods are you not so sure about? This way you're kind of working within their realm of what they're familiar with and in line with what they are looking for. Um, I have to say, though, that my most favorite food to start off with with lactose intolerance, especially because coming from the aspect of working in gut health, is yogurt. I think yogurt is my go to. Recently, I actually did a presentation. So I teach intro to nutrition as well at the university. And we recently did a kind of cooking demo last week. And one of the foods that we did or recipes was a smoothie. And I talked about yogurt and I talked about how, because lactose intolerance is a very common question for my college students. Like, can I eat this? Like, what does this mean? And why, why does this happen? And so we haven't quite gotten to that chapter yet, but I was kind of giving them a preview because I actually was doing the presentation on vitamins and minerals. And I talked about, you know, what's in yogurt and are some of the other smoothie ingredients. I talked about how those live and active cultures that you find in yogurt is really key. But I also wanted to emphasize that live and active piece to it because with so many different yogurts on the market, that live and active isn't always on that label. And so making sure that they see that there, like that lactobacillus, will make sure that those live and active cultures, like Dr. Murray was talking about, could potentially help with that lactose intolerance. So I think yogurt is a great food to start with because it's also a probiotic food when it has those live and active cultures. It can help with the lactose intolerance and see it's just so versatile in the kitchen that it can be incorporated into a lot of different dishes. So. Start with what they like, see what their goals are. But really yogurt, I think, is like my go-to kind of, let's get you back with yogurt and start there. Okay, great. Thank you. And are there any mindfulness tips that you can share with us with regard to lactose intolerance? Yeah. So with lactose intolerance, really kind of being aware and intentional about it. 
being aware to how it's making you feel and kind of also coming into it with an open mind. Like Dr. Murray was saying, I think you had a friend who like swore, you know, he had intolerance like 15 minutes later, but it's like food hasn't reached that part of your body yet in 15 minutes. I try to tell people a good way to incorporate some mindfulness is to pretend like you're a scientist and this is an experiment. Come into it with an open mind to see how it can go. Don't expect anything and, and try to approach it that way. And then I think the other piece of mindfulness that can come really in handy with lactose intolerance in particular is building in intentionality. So how can I be very intentional with building that consistency that we were talking about in adding these foods into my diet so that I can get that goal of having that milkshake or, you know, half of the milkshake because milkshakes on a hot summer day, they just hit different, you know? And so trying to work in intentions, I think is really, really a powerful way, especially with lactose intolerance to get that gut microbiome adapted to have a little bit more of that. Oh, I'm glad you addressed the patient that Dr. Murray was talking about who had this you know, connection mm -hmm. that sounds to me like he's listening to his body. So it gets a little nuanced there where we want people to listen to their bodies. But to your point, going in it with an open mind and maybe learning, oh, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like I'm having these symptoms, but the food isn't to that part of my body yet. So maybe I need to take a step back yeah. and approach this with a little bit more of an open mind. Yeah, definitely approaching with an open mind. Listening to your body, I think, is really, really powerful, but also knowing that it takes time. This is not a one and done situation. That's where also kind of approaching it as a scientist comes into effect. You don't just do one thing and call it, this is it, this is the standard. It takes repeated times to do this. So coming in with an open mind and also testing it in different ways to see how you respond. I think this is why I really like a food and mood journal because Sometimes, like we were just talking about, it's not the food and it's how we feel. So maybe you're really stressed when you came and you ate that whatever food with the lactose in it. And it wasn't because of the lactose. It was because you were, you know, worried about the million things you have to do on your to-do list by 3 p.m. So I think a food and mood journal can be a really helpful tool that's kind of like your third party, you know, neutral thing to have to do some of that remembering for you and to record these things. Cause then you can look back at it and be like, oh, I remember that's when I just finished a meeting and I was eating really quickly. And I was thinking about, you know, the recap of the meeting, what I have to do. And that's when I eat, you know, the pizza or whatever it happens to be. So that mindfulness piece of coming in with the open mind, doing repeated times. And I think a food and mood journal is a great underutilized tool that clinicians can use and that patients just let everyday person can use that doesn't cost you a dime to have. That's a great tip. Before we move on to fermented foods, because I have some questions about that, I do also want either one of you or both of you to comment on, as you're trying to incorporate more dairy foods, what are the recommendations with regard to, you know, do you have it by itself? Do you have it with other foods? What would be the, the best recommendation? It's absolutely critical if you are starting out to build this tolerance that you consume it with other foods. And the reason is this, if I can take a complicated food matrix with other things, it empties from the stomach very slowly. So if I've got fats and carbs and different textures and meat and things, they will all kind of digest slowly and will in little packets release that into the intestine. That's exactly what you want to do with lactose. So if you mix it in with a complicated meal, you end up giving it every opportunity to slowly be digested and absorbed without rushing. And the second thing is, I, I would say, Amanda spoke about this earlier, for God's sake, slow down, put things away, get your cell phones away and think about eating the food the taste of the food, be really mindful because that's part of the problem. I think people are very uptight. Very rushed and yeah, I can relate. To add to that, you know, especially as a dietitian to remind your clients and, and ourselves, because sometimes I'm guilty of this, not going to lie, mm -hmm. to put yourself in rest and digest. I think taking, you know, a couple, like three nice deep breaths right before you eat, kind of intentionally shifting your body from whatever you, you were doing to what you're going to do now and eat. And then 
when it comes to counseling people, like Dr. Murray was saying, to have this food with something else, from a dietitian perspective, I would also consider like, okay, what foods do you feel comfortable with right now that you, you know, you feel this is a, a safe food for you, quote unquote, and use that and have that food accompany the lactose food you're choosing. This way, it feels like there's less variables in the equation for you, which helps both us as a dietitian and our patients as well. Good mindset too, and maybe puts them in that more comfort zone and being able to have that open mind and see what happens. Yeah. Great. Well, Dr. Murray, you you had mentioned fermented foods, and I would really love to talk about fermented foods and digestive health. I did a, a related episode on this. Again, I'll share that towards the end. But I think fermented foods are becoming more popular, but I think a lot of people are still kind of unfamiliar with what are fermented foods, what are the, the sources in our diet, and how do they impact the gut? The process of, of fermenting foods has been around forever in human history. And it can change the flavor and texture of food. And it also can change the composition of the food. And so when you're thinking about dairy products undergoing fermentation, you actually can change the lactose. And that's one of the things that can change during fermentation. The best known fermented products are beer and wine. Uh, and they've used grains and grapes to change that to a liquid that maintains the essence but is different from the original grape or the original grains that are put into that fermentation process. You can ferment meats and legumes and all kinds of different grains. Around the world, we have many, many different examples from miso in Japan and kefir and uh, kumbacha and uh, lots of different things I have used this method to change the food, change the flavor, but also alter its composition in a way that can be greatly beneficial to the microbiome. Thank you. So what specific dairy foods are fermented? I mean, you mentioned kefir or kefir, which I have a, a related episode on that. Is yogurt fermented? Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons why if it's a yogurt and it says natural and live cultures, that is essentially a probiotic type of food that is allowing the bacteria to digest a lot of that lactose and maintaining the bacterial population, both of which can help contribute to gut health. Any other dairy foods that are fermented? Cottage cheese, those milk curds are fermented. That's another one that's very good. When I was a little boy, I used to eat cottage cheese every day. I just loved it. You know, it's one of those foods that mm -hmm. people, again, don't think about that often. But Dr. Murray, did you eat it with peaches, though? I did. Because that, that's the classic <laughs> way. Yeah. I mean, you have to you eat it with peaches. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Yeah. When my childhood, it was peaches and heavy syrup. So I'm sure I got, <laughs> I got demerits for doing that. <laughs> You're still getting the, the nutrients from the peaches there. So we've touched a little bit on live and active cultures and probiotics. Can we talk about the difference between those two? Because I know they're a little different. We've talked about probiotics, prebiotics, postbiotics on the podcast before, but it never hurts to reiterate. What's the difference between probiotics and live and active cultures? Well, I think the first difference is between prebiotics and probiotics because those words are similar enough where people trip over them. Prebiotic is a indigestible or limited digestible carbohydrate that makes it across into the colon. So it's malabsorbed into the colon. And because it's a carbohydrate, that is the fuel for the bacterial population. And those kind of things, prebiotics, really provide fuel for all the bacteria in the colon. They're not selective. With a probiotic, you're trying to introduce a certain type of beneficial bacteria into that very complex colonic uh, microbial population. You have to take it on a regular basis to kind of seed that and get it functional in the colon to get the benefits from that particular strain. It has been shown that probiotics can help many, many different things, uh, clinical issues, but it's also strain specific and the research on it is complex and difficult. And so 
I get a book every year that tells me all the probiotic literature and where we are and what things works and how strong is the research. It's a growing thing. We know more and more about it. But I think it's important to think about something like yogurt, where you have the bacteria, you have a lactobacillus bacteria. That's a very beneficial bacteria for people with lactase insufficiency. And you have this partially digested so that you've gotten the lactose pretty much down. That's a really good combination of prebiotic and probiotic that you're essentially feeding to these people. Okay. And then just to clarify, the live and active cultures, do they help digest the lactose for you? Yes. And that's the key to fermented foods. They have these live cultures and they do the work of changing the food matrix. And in this case, changing the lactose into glucose and galactose and making it easy to absorb. Yeah. Great. And you had mentioned working in pediatrics and working with the medical associations and the pediatricians. And I always think about the pediatricians. Well, my son's pediatrician especially is always saying, you know, watch the flavored milk and the flavored yogurts. And so I know this is a common question. Do we need to worry about the sugar content of some of these dairy products. So what do you tell patients or parents about sugar in these foods and beverages? That's a good question. And everybody kind of asks themselves, I think a lot of parents agonize over it and feel guilty. Uh, My message is I want those five food groups to be consumed. And I want us to hit the marks on the number of servings per week by mixing and matching those food groups. To me, it's nutritional suicide to say that anything that has sugar in it is therefore bad. I want that milk and I want that dairy product into the diet. And if sugar's the trade-off, that's a good trade. It isn't a good trade if it's a donut and there's not much under that sugar. But if the mother or father or grandparent can say, this is a really good food, this is oatmeal, And I'm willing to put some brown sugar on that because that's what allows my child to eat it. That's a good trait. That's good parenting to me. Okay, thank you. We mentioned fiber briefly, but since fiber is so important for digestive health, I just wanted to briefly touch on, because we could talk for hours about the different kinds of fiber in the diet, but I do want to just talk briefly. Maybe, Dr. Murray, you could just kind of give us an overview of the different types of fiber just in general. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The fourth nutrient of concern, and we mentioned before calcium, vitamin D, and potassium coming from dairy. The fourth is fiber. And we just, from the time of being a little child all the way through senior, we just don't get enough in our diet. Right. Fiber is the indigestible material and mostly made up of carbohydrate structures that will be passed into the colon. And that is a great prebiotic. That's the whole thing with prebiotics. It's a carbohydrate fuel for the bacteria. It can come in soluble and insoluble forms. And Amanda can probably talk in more detail about the specifics of that, but it's important that we get in as much fiber as we can and look for many, many different ways to get that fiber into our diet. The main three places that you can look for both fiber and whole grains in general are breads, crackers, and cereals. Pay really close attention to those three food groups, those three elements in there, because those will really give you your best opportunity to boost fiber in the diet. Yes. And Amanda, if you would like to speak to that as well, incorporating different types of fiber into the diet. Yeah. This is where that consistency comes back into play. It's not the sexiest thing to talk about, but it is the most impactful thing for your gut is building in that consistency for that fiber. And then you have, like Dr. Murray was saying, you have that soluble and insoluble. So when we think about that insoluble fiber, you think about that roughage, right? Like the strings of celery, um, maybe some of the pieces of corn, the stuff that kind of sometimes comes out the same way it came in. And I always tell people that's not necessarily a bad thing that, you know, adds weight to your poop. It helps for easy and effortless pooping. And then That soluble fiber is what's attracting the water, kind of helps clean out the digestive system. So the nice thing about fiber is pairing it with like a dairy source, I think could be a really great way, you know, adding something to it. So I'm thinking like this morning, I had oats. 
I even put it on Instagram. I was like, okay, the great debate. Do you do water with oats or do you do milk with oats? Like, you know, <laughs> really, that's like, always a hot topic. When you're making it. Yeah. Like my grandma always made it with water, but nobody ever makes your food like your grandma does, right? Like it's always hard to replicate. But I wanted that protein and I didn't have any like fluid milk. So what I ended up doing is I made my oats with water, grabbed some yogurt and stirred it in. So now I not only have protein in my oats, now I also have some good fiber as well. So I think finding ways to build in fiber into your diet, like this could be like you're saying a whole podcast in of itself is a great topic in so many directions we could really go into, but really starting with what you like. Like if it's a cracker, what can I pair with this cracker? Is there a different cracker I can do with it? Um, or even building off of your oatmeal and sprinkling in some chia seeds or sprinkling in some flax seeds. So build off what you're already doing, I think is a great avenue, both from a clinician standpoint and from an everyday person standpoint. How can I add? Love adding things. Well, so where we miss out, I think, in the U.S. is we don't tend to eat fruits and vegetables, which is an excellent source of fiber. And, and that's one of the reasons why fiber is, is such a nutrient of concern is that, you know, we've worked on fruits and vegetables for 50 years without really being able to uh, move the mark. So, you know, it is easiest to focus on bread, crackers, and cereals for getting fiber into the diet. But the best way you could do it is to put more fresh fruit, uh, or not even fresh, any kind of fruit, frozen, canned, fresh vegetables, anything you can do are frozen and canned, get those into the diet. Right. I'm glad you mentioned that because I always say on the podcast, if we could change one thing, mm -hmm. it would be to get more fruits and vegetables in our diet because nine out of 10 people are not meeting that goal. And that would help us with the fiber. It would help us with vitamins and minerals. Oh my God. And I'm so glad you said it doesn't have to be fresh because I really feel yeah. like if people knew that canned, frozen, even juices from fruits and vegetables are dried mm -hmm. uh, fruits, you know, that might help us meet our goal if we knew that. And it would be easier to, to incorporate those foods. Um, Dr. Murray, you also mentioned earlier that we want to meet these goals. So I wanted to follow up and ask, how many servings of dairy are we aiming for? Because we didn't specify. Well, for most of us, it's three servings a day would be sufficient to get all the benefits of dairy along with the calcium, vitamin D, and potassium. Adolescence is the one area where they could actually use a more during that time because of the growth spurt. They're really packing calcium into their bones, which they're going to use for life. And um, unfortunately, middle schoolers, uh, at least for girls, middle school is like hitting the wall. Their diet changes dramatically and they tend to really drop dairy intake. Boys tend to maintain it longer, but neither one of them has consistently gotten three servings a day. And to me, that's an easy way to build diet quality. You know, if I could just get people to do the dairy piece, their diet quality would go up no matter how constrain the other aspects of their diet is. Right, right. That period of adolescence, when the needs really increase and the diet quality tends to decrease, so you pair those two things together and it's not a good recipe. It is not. Before we wrap up, Dr. Murray, being a pediatric gastroenterologist and working with physicians and pediatricians, can you give us maybe like a brief overview of the different needs of the different life stages. And I know that is a big <laughs> task and biting off more than we can chew. But I just would love to hear, you know, kind of like infancy, childhood, adolescence, or maybe there's a common thread with all of those. Well, I think the common thread is consistency to the dietary guidelines for Americans. And if you look on myplate.gov, you can get recommendations that are both general and all of us benefit from the number of servings of the five food groups you know, per week and how to make that happen. But also you can get specific information. It does change dramatically. Little children in the first three years, particularly when you think about it, they're, they're not only growing skeletal-wise, but muscular organ development, brain development is enormous during this time. And they can't get cut short on nutrition during this time without consequences. 
The same kind of thing happens we just talked about bone growth during the pubertal growth spurt. That's where you're locking away all the minerals into your bones. If you short it, you pay for it later, you know, and we get osteoporosis. Pregnancy, enormous benefits to mother, to the outcome of the pregnancy, and to the fetus by having mom have a really high quality diet. So these are giving us our public health uh, directions. And now that I'm moving into uh, my senior years here, I'm starting to think more about protein and making sure that I'm maintaining a really high quality diet in order to get aging to be the best it can be. I don't want to give away anything. You know, I, it's, it's a natural process, but I'm not giving it away. I want to be as healthy as I can be. Thank you so much. Is there anything else that we should cover that our listeners need to know about digestive health, nutrient-rich foods, mindfulness, any parting words of wisdom from both of you? I would mention, I think you probably do this as part of your podcast, Melissa, but I would mention, make sure that you're going to resources that are giving you the right information. I always send people to Kids Eat Right, for example, uh, the uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics site. Uh, healthychildren.org is the AAP site that has great information on parenting in general, but also nutrition. And there's other places you can go, Mayo Clinic, you know, and Harvard and some of the, the centers that are nutrition centers. But man, there's so much trash on the internet. You've really got to get a good counseling to make good decisions. Great point. Thank you. Amanda? Another reason why you don't want to scroll and eat. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> right. It'll really affect your digestion. Right? Um, I think my tip, especially kind of coming from a gut health perspective, is one of the hardest things as a clinician and as just an everyday person is building variety in the diet and how impactful variety can be for your gut microbiome. It is the hardest thing because we grow up eating the same things like we're used to eating cottage cheese and peaches or whatever it is. <laughs> and so now you go to the grocery store and you pick up the same things you grew up with. Uh, so I think variety is where we can build in and make a lot of change that is very impactful for our health. And so when I think about, you know, different foods, whether it's dairy foods or fruits and vegetables, don't discount it once just because you didn't like it. So like I'm thinking of broccoli, like, OK, there's some ways of broccoli that like I personally don't love. But maybe if I air fry it or if I sprinkle it with cheese, now we got something going on. So continuing to try foods and try it in different ways. So even if it's the same food and trying it in different ways it can be a really good way to start getting yourself used to different things, seeing what you like and building in that variety. Wonderful message. We always talk about variety on the show. Thank you for those uh, website mentions, Dr. Murray. Amanda, do you have any websites you want to share, perhaps yours? Yeah, you guys can um, check out my Instagram. It's usually where I have I share a lot of different stuff. I recently did like a yogurt bark that I did with the Dairy Council. It was really yummy. Um, and my handle is at guthealth.nutritionist. Great. Okay. And I have a ton of resources that I'll be putting in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. I've got handouts, tip sheets on gut health, lactose intolerance. There's a scientific summary on that, as well as other resources, recipes, of course. You can also find more information at drink-milk.com, winnersdrinkmilk.com, thedairyalliance.com, and also usdairy.org. There are also many other regional and state dairy councils all over the U.S. with a ton of great resources. I also mentioned there were some related episodes. So if anybody's interested, they can go check those out. Episode 212 is about food choices in the gut microbiome. Episode 200 is the science and story behind kefir. Ooh. Episode 184 is about postbiotics and immune health. And episode 162 is digestive health, probiotics, prebiotics, and fermentation. So thank you both so much for coming on the show and talking about this important topic. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind and digestive health and dairy. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke, produced by JAG in Detroit Podcasts. 